ready? Mm-hmm. You ready? Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Pinal County Community College District Governing Board meeting of March 19th, 2024. And if uh, Board Member Kasuga will please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes, please rise. thank you. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And uh, we'll note that everyone's here except Dr. Ordion, who's not here today, but all the other board members are here. And so the first thing on, next thing on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt? So moved. I'll second. I have a motion and second to, all, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. And a. Motion carries. All right. Next item is call to the public. Uh, just so everybody knows, the board is prohibited by ARA statute from discussing, considering, or action on items raised during the call to the public. Individuals are limited to three minutes presentation. Is there anybody that would like to speak? And nobody turned in a card. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll move on to the next item. Uh, consideration of consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second? I'll second. I have a motion and second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thank you. So let's go to reports. And the first report we have from our college president, Dr. Elliott. Good afternoon, Chairman Lopez, uh, President Lopez, board members, faculty, staff, and guests, and Mary Lou. I have quite a bit to share with you this afternoon, so bear with me. Um, First, I want to share with you, we did um, receive notification that we um, are the um, recipient, along with Arizona Western and Yavapai, for a Perkins grant in the amount of $3.4 million um, to uh, improve and expand CTE programs. Um, we're going to use the funds to expand the AIT program, which is the Automated Industrial Technology Program and for some equipment, as well as starting a non-credit pre-apprenticeship program that can lead to one of the 14 apprentice programs that are part of the construction unions. Cool. So we're really excited about that. We've, we've had some great success um, partnering with Arizona Western and Yavapai. In fact, I got a call this morning from President Kaur at Arizona Western and said, I have another one, do you wanna join us on that? So um, <laughs> we have really enjoyed these collaborations. <clears throat> the second thing I want to highlight is we have had a student selected as a Coca-Cola Silver Scholar, um, and that's Tiffany McClellan, and she was, uh, will receive a $1,200 scholarship. Um, so that's a big deal. In addition to that, and that's part of um, Phi Theta Kappa, in addition to that, Dr. Sandy Rath, our PK, PTK advisor, has been named um, a 2024 Distinguished Advisor. So that, wow. that's a great award. I believe she's received that award many times. <laughs> yeah, so that's wonderful. Um, and um, huge, great, huge thank you to Andrew Clegg on the Perkins work there. Um, we have two other, uh, another grant I wanna share with you that um, we're really grateful for having Hugo Steinkamp. And we did receive a water conservation grant we actually received two. The first grant is for $141,000, and it will fund the purchase of hydroflow devices. Um, that This equipment uses wave signals to stop scale from forming in the circulating water column of the cooling tower, which mm -hmm. is part of our HVAC system. Mm -hmm. This means the system no longer must flush, be flushed out for, frequently to remove scale, and millions and millions of gallons of water are, are lost annually when we do have to do that. So um, we're really excited that we have that um, grant, and we were one of 14. Um, oh, they received 14 applications, and they only awarded two, so C CAC was awarded that. We do have a match with that grant. It's around $47,000. The second water conservation grant we received was for 183,000 and it will enable facilities to replace the natural turf on the softball field, um, or 
with um, artificial turf, and that will save us probably 1.5 million gallons of water annually. So we're really looking at um, some sustainability efforts here um, for um, our institution. And our match for that grant is $45,000. So any questions about those grants before I move into the legislation? Yes. Yes, Evelyn. Yes, uh, Mr. Board President, Dr. Elliott, where did the water conservation grants come from? Who was the source? Um, sources? I think it was the state. Oh, um, it, they came from the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority oh, of Arizona. Oh, WIFA. Yeah, WIFA. Yeah, WIFA. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Yeah. Congratulations. Well, Hugo did a, a lot of the work, so we're, we're lucky to have people like Hugo and Andrew that help get external funding for us. So I'll move on some um, legislation. Some of these you've heard me talk about before, um, but uh, we'll go ahead and share them uh, and where, they're, where they are at right now. So House Bill 2089, again, it has to do with state aid being withheld from a community college district that exceeds its expenditure limitation according to the calculations. It would be retroactive from 2023, and it's been on the House caucus calendar since February 19th. So no other movements really happened with that. Um, House Bill 2481, I think I brought this up before, it's various changes related to open meeting laws. The legislation legislature is removed from the definition of a public body and is therefore exempt from open meeting laws, which is interesting. All public bodies are required to provide an opportunity for public comment in person before any final decision and, and provide a sufficient amount of seating to accommodate their reasonable anticipated attendance. And agendas for public meetings must be available to the public 48 hours, which is an increase from 24 hours before the meeting and must be made publicly online with a hyperlink to any relevant documents. So that would create a lot, a little extra work. Now, this is scheduled for a committee hearing um, on March 21st, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, again, House Bill 2501, we've talked about this one as well. This allows a county to remove, move, move itself from a community college district if 10% of the qualified electors in that county petition for removal. Um, and again, this uh, was, there was a House third reading on March 3rd on this one, so. Excuse me, what, what was that, Bill? Uh, 2501, House Bill 2501. So then um, House Bill 2593, it has to do with public records requests as we talked about last time, if it is determined that a public body willfully or intentionally refuses to comply with the public records request or otherwise acts in bad faith, they must, they must be assessed a civil penalty, penalty ranging from 500 to 5,000 for each occurrence. Um, this, it also requires any entity that receives a public records request to respond within five business days of receiving the request. However, the response only has to be, I received your request, you will have um, this in a whatever timeline. So we have to provide a timeline. This is scheduled for a committee hearing on March 21st as well. Um, Senate Bill 1005, again, we've talked about this one. It prohibits public entities, including state universities and community college, from spending public monies on diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, requiring employees to participate, and or entering in a contract with a company to participate in DEI. This um, is placed on the House caucus calendar, so upcoming. Um, Senate Bill 1190 changes the minimum student enrollment requirement for a community college district to establish a collegiate special plate fund to 9,000 students from 50,000 students. Um, this bill is placed on the House cal caucus calendar. It's interesting that it's Pima Community College that really ha is pushing this to have the personalized license plates. However, an institution wanting to do that, and we would have to use foundation dollars, it costs $32,000 to participate in the specialized license plant 
fund. So um, that one is an interesting bill, of course. Um, Senate Bill 1198, uh, again, um, you've heard this one. It, it prohibits the governing board of any university college or community college from enacting and enforcing any policy or rule that prohibits possession of a concealed weapon if that individual has a valid permit. And this is also placed on the House caucus calendar. Um, Senate what Bill 1731, I've mentioned this one before. It allows members of the public body to discuss ma matters raised by those who address the public body during an open call to the public at a public meeting without that matter being on the agenda. And again, this is also placed on the House caucus calendar. And that, that is all I have on the bills so there's a lot that we're watching some are moving some are are kind of stalled yes jerry what was the one about the uh, concealed carry permit um that is um senate bill 1198 and i'm happy to answer any questions that i might be able to answer about the proposed like, bills so dr elliott the hb 2501 the allowing the county to remove itself does that affect our taxes the taxes property taxes on the school that we get from that the know? removed county remains subject to taxes for the payment of any indebtedness incurred by the district where the county was within the district okay so it doesn't change that portion mm -mm. okay that's what i was worried about loss of revenue yeah so good question any other questions thank you so mis no miscellaneous no I that I that's a placeholder in case something comes in at the okay. last minute <laughs> all right the next item is our business affairs report Lisa Ott, please good afternoon is this on yeah. can you hear me okay there we go all right, good afternoon, um, Governing Board President Lopez, fellow board members, Dr. Elliott, Mary Lou, and staff and guests. We have for you in your packet the monthly budget report. Uh, this monthly budget report reflects the year-to-date information as of January of 2024. January 2024 shows the district's operating fund expenditures at 52.12% of total budget. This is an increase of 8.94 from January 2023, which was 43.18%. Are there any questions on the monthly budget report? Any questions from the board? No? Thank you. Okay. And then also in your packet, you have the awarded bids over $20,000. Are there any questions on those items? It looks like things we need to purchase for sure for the school. Any questions from the board? We're all good? No, looks good. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, next we have the Wiley Important Goals and Outcomes Progress Report. And Dr. Gillian, please. Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, Governing Board Chair Lopez, members of the board, Dr. Elliott, Mary Lou, colleagues, students, and guests. Uh, thank you for having me here to speak this afternoon. Um, so I'm giving a presentation. I was originally slated to do this with one of our academic deans, Suzanne Crockett, who has been very instrumental in this project. Um, but let me just say, first of all, that um, this project relates to, especially to the wildly important goal of uh, creating a world-class learner experience. Uh, because when we speak about bookstores and books and learning materials, and, and as we go through this presentation, I'm gonna shift our language a little bit away from the concept of bookstore to instructional materials, providing instructional materials because it's a bigger concept. Uh, but when we really think about that, the, the real reason for having those materials is for students. And so um, well, let's start off by, um, I wanted to share with you that there are really three issues that led to this project. And, and let me say as well that this project is not finished. So um, we're kind of reporting 
mm, part way through, a, a, a long way through, but not, not at the end. So of course <coughs> our primary concern is how to best provide learning materials for the college and for students uh, and to ensure the students get what they need. And you know, we really prefer that they do get them on the first day. Um, that's not always possible, but, but that is something that we talk about a great deal. Um, we're always very concerned about keeping costs down for students. That's huge, huge in all of our minds. Um, and then there's a third issue, and this is not one that we really invented, but this sort of came to us, um, and I, I'll kind of explain how we got there, but um, the issue is that if a lot of our learning materials now are digital or can be easily shipped, do we really need an on-the-ground bookstore? So I'm going to explain a little bit about how we got to that question. Uh, we did not invent that question. It kind of landed in our laps. Uh, okay, so... Um, over the year, there's obviously been a lot of change in bookstore materials, and if many of us think back, if I think back to my own college experiences, boy, really different you know, world uh, than our students live in today. Um, there's been a huge change in the cost of materials, um, and we do find that at community colleges, sometimes the cost of the learning materials are much higher than the cost of our tuition uh, and the cost of our courses. Um, we know that students cut costs by purchasing from cheaper online retailers or you know, getting hand-me-downs from other students or whatever it might be, but they oftentimes nowadays, because of those high costs, will avoid going to the bookstore and purchasing their materials. And sometimes, sadly, they forego getting the materials at all. And it's not the purchasing that I really want to emphasize, but having those materials in their hands. So, um, so an issue that is a part of this is that campus bookstores are selling fewer books and doing less well from a business point of view. And while that isn't our primary concern as a college, we do want those materials available and we do want to make sure that you know, we're engaging in this, this space of, of instructional materials in the right way. So our current situation, um, our, our current vendor, we've had uh, a long-term relationship with Barnes & Noble um, that used to have actually a, an on-the-ground store at all of our campus locations, uh, maybe except for Aravipa, uh, but um, over the, for quite a while that's only been at two of our campuses, um, and we have them right next door. Um, so, but they not only provide you know, the books and the digital access and all of those things for classes, but they provide student supplies and spirit items and a whole lot of other things. So um, over the last number of years, they've been increasingly losing revenue because the students are not purchasing the materials as they did in the past. Um, and then just sort of a little side issue, but it's one that we had to figure into this project, is that when they don't sell materials, part of our contract with them is that we have to subsidize um, the materials that are ordered and not sold uh, in terms of some restocking fees. And I'm not the financial expert here, so I don't know exactly what that entails, but I do know that that has become a consideration for us. Um, but along with that, our current partner, Barnes & Noble, actually came to us and proposed a new model several years ago. We've actually heard presentations from them probably about three times, I believe. Um, they had become increasingly aware that what they're doing is not working, and so they have gone to a new model um, called, I believe it's called First Day Ready, but the idea is that, um, well, I'll explain it a little bit more, but that students are charged by the credit hours they're registered for no matter the cost of the materials. But all students are sort of automatically enrolled in this program. Um, students can opt out, but they have to physically opt out of and, and then not participate in purchasing from the bookstore in that way. They can still purchase individual items, but they wouldn't be part of that plan. Um, but from the bookstore's point of view, from, from the vendor's point of view, this is a, a more tenable, a more profitable solution or at least a more manageable solution. So, so those were all things we had to think about. And I will say that when they first, um, when, when they first proposed this to us, we listened to the presentation actually just in the, the President's and VP group and we kind of thought, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. We're not really interested in going this route. Uh, and particularly when we looked at the th idea that, so say you're taking 15 credits uh, as a student, you would be charged a flat rate for each of those credits, no matter the cost of the books in, in that class. Now, the books could be quite high, but they could also be low or just non-existent. Um, and at the time, we were moving, and we still want to move more uh, strongly in the direction of open educational resources, which are free to students, um, so free digital download. So on this new model, um, everything gets counted, and that's what averages the price and makes it lower per student. 
Okay. Um, one of the issues that um, was is proposed, and, and, and we tend, to, you know, we can see this that th there's equitable access. How to make materials more cost effective for more students? If there's a flat rate, it may be more more affordable for more students. But you know, it's that's just something we, we are looking at in this project. Um, we do know that more of our materials, more and more of our materials are um, provided digitally already, and the digital delivery actually does carry cost savings, so, um, but um, it also might provide other kinds of benefits, and, um, you know, what we, what we learned in the process of this project is that not only our current vendor, but pretty much everybody does provide options, so not everything has to be digital. Uh, it can be, they can all provide textbooks, they can all provide rental books, they can provide other kinds of things. But unlike now where um, a faculty member can say place an order for materials and um, maybe their preference is to have the digital but there's also the possibility of a textbook, um, the, the, the vendor can provide both of those. With this first day model, pretty much everybody we've looked at, um, you choose one. So um, it would be, one of those choices. Okay, so yeah, um, so some of the drawbacks of this kind of a model are that it requires the students to opt out if they don't want to participate, and sometimes they don't really know what they're opting into or opting out of, and it, you know, it, I, I, think, I think the savvy student will figure out that it might even vary from semester to semester, and they might be ready and poised to do that, but there might be a learning curve there. Um, uh, and again, as I said, we have some courses, or we have quite a lot of courses that include uh, materials that are completely free. We are not as far ahead on that project as we had hoped to be, um, because it requires a huge investment on the part of faculty to create all the materials that go along with those OERs, which usually don't provide all the extra stuff. So, uh, but we are still working at it, and we are still interested in continuing that. Um, you know, a benefit on the other side is that even though the OERs, um, well, the when the OERs help lower costs for students, there isn't necessarily a direct benefit to the student in the class that's using it. So, so it's kind of a trade-off there. Okay, so some of our considerations in this project, and this is where academics got involved. Um, Dr. Elliott came to us. We realized that um, our new bookstore, um, or, or our current bookstore, is not going to give us a choice anymore and that we're going to have to go to this model. So knowing that we would have to go to this model, we started asking some more questions. First of all, are there other vendors that provide similar services and what do those costs look like across the different vendors? Are there different kinds of options? Um, and then, um, you know, I, I will say that the, the question arose that if we are really going to go with this kind of a model, do we really need the on the ground presence? And we know from a couple of sister colleges that there's a, they, there are a couple of other colleges in Arizona, actually quite a few, that have gone uh, a different routes. Arizona Western, that's my second example, Arizona Western just got rid of any kind of bookstore ordering and said, just figure out where you're going to get stuff. Students are already ordering from online vendors, and I don't want to advertise a particular name necessarily, but you know, we all know who we're talking about, and you know, the, just do it that way. Um, or go to OERs or use whatever materials that are available on campus. Um, Eastern Arizona College took a slightly different uh, um, uh, perspective. They did uh, partner with one of these vendors, um, and not, not our current one, um, but that vendor doesn't have an on-the-ground presence. They could, but they also have the, uh, the possibility of not having that, and that is kind of what a lot of them are moving to as, as a preference. Eastern Arizona created their own campus store um, where they choose what materials to stock, what kinds of supplies students need, and even their own spirit items. They pick and choose and they get to sell them, and they have reported this as being very successful so far. Um, they really like that model, so. Um, so those are things that we, we know and we're, we're looking at. The tasks that came to us in academics and really came to um, Dean Crockett as kind of the lead for this project um, was to look at the models for book and material providers um, and to share information with key stakeholders of the college and to consider whether we might be ready for a digital model. And by that, I don't mean that we would require that all of our learning materials are digital. There's still the option for faculty to order textbooks from any of these groups. There's still the option for students to get those kinds of things, but that a not on the ground provider would liberate us from some of those extra costs. It does take some things away potentially as well. So, 
you know, we wanted to start looking at what does this look like? We went into this with an open mind of, you know, let's explore what are the options and, and let's share those options with key stakeholders at the college. So, um, okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Dean Crockett led the charge um, and we invited several vendors to give the same presentation um, to the same groups of stakeholders. And uh, we really created three different groups of stakeholders and we looked at three vendors who are kind of leaders in the field. And we know that other of our uh, sister colleges are using some of these or we know of them through, you know, through other kinds of uh, groups that we belong to. Now, I want to be clear that from the academic side, our charge was not an RFP. We are not the financial folks. We are not making decisions about which company to use. We were simply exploring what options are out there, not in terms of the companies necessarily, but in terms of what, what, do, they, what do they have? What's packaged in what they're offering and what do those costs maybe look like? So, um, so our job wasn't really to decide and recommend a single vendor. It was to say, hey, you know, these are the kinds of things that we like or the kinds of things we're concerned about. Um, so anyway, so, the, so th each of these presenters presented to three different groups and gave slightly different presentations. So uh, the key support stakeholders uh, were IT, uh, people from IT, learning support, faculty teaching and learning, uh, student services, and especially advising and enrollment, um, and also student accessibility, because accessibility is a huge issue and that's a whole Another presentation, not for me, um, but I, we're all involved in it. Um, the second group was academic leadership, which are our academic deans, division chairs, academic program directors, faculty senate. I apologize, I don't have faculty senate on the list there, but they're a key member of academic leadership. And then we had a few other people involved in that who needed to be there from student accounts and some uh, financial aid uh, who didn't didn't come to the first one. And then the final group was executive leadership, Dr. Elliott and the VPs, and which sometimes ended up just being a very small group. And sometimes we were hearing the same thing again that we had heard before, but we decided for consistency we would go through the same presentations for each vendor. Um, so you're gonna, I don't have a, the copy of the PowerPoint's not in the packet, but Mary Lou will get that to you. I just included who was involved in each of the groups, so you can see Group B, this is a huge wide range of people who were involved in, in that academic leadership group. Um, and you know they're pretty key because those would be chairs and directors and faculty who are really thinking about ordering materials. And then this is just a slide that shows you know when we had the different meetings and that we set them up and we're consistent about it for each of the groups. Um, and then I'm gonna breeze through this. I am not going to talk at length it, down in the weeds about what each of these vendors offer, but they are slightly different. Um, you know, some of, uh, in, in uh, two of the three cases, um, when you get the digital downloaded material, students have the option of engaging with them in rather interesting ways online. And you can even get data about what your student's doing, if you're a faculty member, how, have they opened the materials? Have they, how much time have they spent with the materials? Whoa, this is kind of a cool thing, right? Because that's not something, they, they might tell us that I spent six hours on my homework and you're like, yeah, you read that for five minutes or you didn't even open it at all. Uh, so, um, so those are kind of some interesting features. Um, so the groups we looked at were uh, Barnes & Noble, a group called Academos, and I think I mentioned this before, and then the third one, oops, um, I'm sorry, the second one was BibliU, and that's always hard for me to say, uh, but um, they're kind of an old company. They came out of the UK originally. We're, they're sort of newer to us uh, here in the States, but they've got a pretty wide distribution as well in the States. Uh, BibliU and Academos are primarily working at a distance with their stakeholders, and Barnes & Noble is primarily interested in maintaining both, in moving to that first day model, but also keeping an on-the-ground presence, um, because that is something that is a part of their traditional model. Okay, so all of that, we're looking at all these different vendors, we're looking at a whole different way of getting materials. And it's partly because, you, actually largely, because the world out there has changed. Uh, and the world does continue to change. But this is a really big change. And I think three years ago when we first heard about this model, we didn't think that this was going to be the wave of the future necessarily. Dr. Elliott probably thought it was the wave of the future. But most of the rest of us were not thinking that everybody was going to be going this direction. But now we find in ourselves in a situation where we basically have to choose one of these models and what is it going to be. And it doesn't have to be one of these vendors. It, 
is just the kinds of models that we're looking for. So the next step, and we're actually partway through this, is a stakeholder survey. Uh, so when the survey results, and the, the survey asks questions about, you know, um, and, and the survey is going out to all of the people who t attended the presentation, so all of those stakeholders, not the entire college. But uh, we're asking questions about what are the most consider important considerations for the stakeholders in the kinds of vendor, the kinds of materials that we have available. And then we're also asking questions about the availability of an on-campus bookstore and how significant is that for our community stakeholders, how important they think it is for our students because all of this is really focused on the students in the end and, and what, you know, what is best for them. So once we get that survey um, completed or get all the results, um, we will share that with Dr. Elliott and then the next steps will be not in the academic world but back in the finance world and uh, doing an RFP for the instructional materials provider that we would end up choosing for our college. But that would have to be a competitive process. So, um, and then the timeline is the next couple of weeks to complete the survey and make our recommendations based on the stakeholder input and then we go forward from there. Um, so there will be more to this story, uh, but this is about where we are now. And it has been a very big project, but kind of a behind the scenes one, one that we haven't really talked about a lot. We have talked about it a fair amount among faculty uh, and because of course, you know, that's central to their world. So, um, so I will end there and take any questions that you might have. Sure. Any questions, yes, Board Member Walker. Okay. I uh, want you to go back over the one that uh, Eastern Arizona College is using. Oh, so they are using, they're using um, one of the vendors um, and, and they chose probably through a similar process. I'm guessing they had to do an RFP. Um, and um, so they chose to, to use one of them, but they decided to create their own on-campus store. And so they hired the staff. They had the space already. They hired the staff. They're deciding what goes in the store. They're deciding what the prices are for the items in the store. And if there's any overage of materials, well, it belongs to the college. It's all part of the college. So uh, it is a very different business model. Now, that would be a lot of work in a different part of the college that we don't already do, but it's not insurmountable. And they've been very forthcoming and have shared a lot of information with us and are willing to continue to share that kind of information. We also know that there are other people who have done it, but that was our closest neighbor who, who has done it. I just want to share that over the last uh, several years, I've been watching the trend that is happening with third-party vendors and, and institutions and, and more and more institutions going fully OER. Um, we, we, we were ambitious trying. and wanted yeah. to go there. And, and I think what has happened is many institutions were ambitious and wanting to go to OER because of equity, access, affordability. Uh, but we're really maybe struggling getting people to let go of, of the traditional model. Unfortunately, the handwriting's on the wall. Bookstores are, are, are maybe not interested in, in providing us service anymore if students are getting their books in, from other places. Um, and so I just felt like it was time that we really, you know, where are we with OER? Maybe 30%? That's about right, yeah. But, and we wanted to get to 100%. We've been working on that project for quite some time. And um, again, the time and effort that it takes faculty to develop OER, um, at what cost, what benefits, so then that's why we started to look at this model. But eventually, and, mo and many colleges and universities across the nation have moved in, in similar directions, either fully OER or a digital, and then they open their own spirit shops. And one of the things that would be nice about if we decide to do our own um, spirit shop or convenience store is you have to keep in mind we have a lot of international students and we could stock within our own you know CAC spirit shop things that maybe would appeal to our international students more so than what a big box store is going to always put on every shelf on every campus and not be customizable so again really trying to think about how do we create a world-class learner experience if if you don't have transportation, you're an international student, and you want to go to our, our bookstore to get something that you need, and we don't have it. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity in it. It would be a big, huge change. Um, and you, you, there's that saying, the only person that likes change is a wet baby. But um, I think, I think time, time, the times for us as an institution to, 
to be creative and innovative are, are here. So that's just a little background on, on the trends that I have noticed over many years. And thank you. We have had some very robust conversations about all of this. I tried to just pick out some of the, the, the threads of this because it really is a very complicated and overlapping story. We are going to have change <coughs> one way or the other. The question is, are we ready for the big leap? Are we going to take it in baby steps? Um, you know, but there will be change. So change is coming for us. So, any other questions? Any I'm other sorry. questions, comments? I just wanted to know, is our bookstore currently run by an independent vendor? or Yes, it's, yes. it's ran by Barnes & Noble. Oh, okay. And I will add that that's very typical of colleges up until, like, it has been fairly typical. There are a couple of big vendors that are out yeah, there on a lot of campuses. Depending on your size. I was really surprised when I came here that Barnes & Noble would even pick us yeah. up. Mm -hmm. The size where I, I was at a previous institution where we had, you know, I, I think 30,000 students and we had a Barnes & Noble. So it, depending on the size of the institution, you may, may run your own bookstore. At one institution I worked at, we did run our own bookstore because nobody wanted, we were too small. Our enrollment was too That's small. That's what I thought it currently was. Yeah. I, and, you know, we may become less desirable for Barnes & Noble as they're having, having to look at their own business model and maybe choosing to only be and in, in institutions with enrollments in the, the you know, tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, they obviously are. They wouldn't have approached us. They're, at least at this point in time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? <coughs> I just like the idea of having books. Yeah, I, I, I share used that. Them. I, they work I like for me. <laughs> the old school guy. <laughs> I but used them and they work for me. And, yeah. and uh, the only problem I ever found with books is people stealing them from me. So uh, books are a good idea. Even people who are thieves are profiting from them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it was a hybrid. When I, I went to finish my MBA in 2016, 15, uh, some were online and others were hard copy and then you rent them. But I, I had to return them, they were expensive. So I, I wish I didn't have to return them because I liked them for reference. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, that's the only thing. I guess you could do that with digital, but it would end, you know, and the digital your subscription would. Yeah, I think in every conversation we've had is that um, students could have the opportunity still to go to, we won't name that, right. there's two book, yeah, and like get that. their own hard <laughs> copy for, you know, much less than a 35% markup or whatever the markup is. Um, and Arizona Western, what they actually did is they just put in their syllabus where students could go and get the particular book and just kind of mm -hmm. left it up to the students um, in that situation. But uh, there would always still be an opportunity for students to have that, that book if they so desired. Um, it's, it's about carrying inventory and stocking yeah. inventory. It's about uh, the business model. Mm -hmm. No, that's very true. Uh, I think, and I think you had access to used books also, and, uh, and that made it more affordable, mm -hmm. even though, you know, as long as the book was re legible and mm -hmm. everything else was okay. And used we didn't share this part, but correct me if I'm wrong, some of the, the vendors that presented, they can actually get the cost down to about $60 a semester for the students mm -hmm. Hmm. and you That's know really could good. you sixty dollars to have all your materials mm -hmm. and if you really wanted a book then you have you have a little bit more money than you would if you're paying two hundred and fifty dollars for the book in the bookstore I, I didn't share that because we did get some figures but they were sort of estimates based on current lists or a previous year's list but they were all running at a pretty reasonable rate and mm -hmm. um, you know some of them a little higher some of them a little much lower actually, if significantly lower, but um, yeah, so this flat rate, although it sounds like it might be charging a lot, in fact, it doesn't seem to be outrageous. And in some cases, it seems quite, quite a good thing. Yes. Uh, we did hear from a couple of the vendors that students who had opted out decided to opt back in when they realized that they were paying yeah. almost the same amount for maybe a single book what that does, they would uh, be for the What does semester. this do to uh, uh, people who want to maintain a, a, a paper file of what they've done and uh, what about copyright infringements for printing that cer uh, a certain portion of a book out for uh, your personal uh, education and for uh, 
getting things done on the college, college campus and satisfying the needs for you know, your personal records with each individual instructor or professor. Well, I probably don't have a complete answer to that. I'm not really the complete expert, but I think for personal use, you can you can copy things, you can download them. You just can't distribute them. You can't sell them to other people. Uh, you can't, you know, somebody can't copy them and hand them out to their whole class in paper. But my guess is that I mean, I, I've and and I'm I'm kind of old school. I do both. I personally, I read. Um, you know, digital and books, and I have a house filled with books, uh, and I, I also like them, but I have seen my younger generation, because I have much younger children, um, as they went through school, they are very adept in the digital world, and um, I have a daughter who's in grad school right now at NAU, and hasn't had to purchase a single piece of material. Everything has been digital downloads, and they've been free. Um, so, um, you know, I think, I think you can copy things for your own use, but again, there's that distribution, and we would need to probably have some policy about that and be very specific about it if we go this route. Well, I guess I, so. I was teaching a, a, a course one time at a, at a college, and uh, the, uh, the thing that I was able to do was write my own textbooks, but as long as I gave you know, a good syllabus, or not necessarily syllabus, but uh, a, uh, a list of all the sources mm -hmm. uh, for the comments that I made. I, I wrote my actually wrote my own textbooks for the for the students and let them copy it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether I violated any copyright infringements by uh, making copies of someone else's a, a phrase that they made in their their book or whatever. But it was bothersome to me, and it was also bothersome to the school that I was going to, as well as the one I was teaching at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I think there have been some interim models as well. I mean, I taught for a time when we often would create readers out of a collection of articles, but then, you know, you would write off and get the copyright permission, and it really wasn't that extra expensive, and it would be added to the digi added to that compiled list. And this is still a print day, so then those were available for students. Um, now we actually provide a lot of that <coughs> access, and our libraries actually help our faculty um, to, um, you know, to get links and embed things that are digital um, resources that we have here at the college because we have. A a lot of databases and a lot of e-resources and you know so we actually are using a lot of these things we're just we're using a mix so you know again it was really important to start engaging our community in the conversation and you know see see where that takes us so um, okay. yeah, yeah. any more fun. questions oh thank you it's, it's a lot to think about uh, it is a lot yes it's thank it is you a big so change much. I think yeah, but, but I think the students come up when you do the stoke the stakeholder surveys I think you're getting the students, right? And then, so, so do you have? I don't think we've included students just yet. We've been looking at the people who are the upfront users, but right. you know that that could still be an additional step. Yeah. Sure. So uh, we we kind of know what our students are using from what our experiences in the classroom and what they respond to, but mostly they respond they respond a lot to cost. Um, oh, that, yeah, absolutely. That's a huge driver for them. So uh, yeah, we absolutely. really want to yeah, be mindful. Yeah, sixty dollars is. Yeah. Really good price for all your books. Exactly. It's like hundreds and hundreds of dollars for each class sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, so that would, took a lot of your, either take out grants or, or take out scholarships, or well, you get scholarships, but take out student loans mm -hmm. to help cover the cost. They're so expensive. That's right. And I'm still paying on mine, so, you know, <laughs> it's just something you have to do. So, okay, great. Thank you. Oh, that was great information. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We look forward to the results so we can look at different options. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. All right. Next, we have a uh, call to the board. Uh, board member Walker. I'm still, I'm still extremely pleased about the progress that's being made in AJ. Yeah. Uh, on the campuses up there, I can see the, the buildings going together now, and, and that's encouraging. Uh, I would still like to see uh, some consideration for a uh, public meeting facility, arts and entertainment center, or something like that. That's that's going to be a shot in the arm for the public in AJ, and it might be a very uh, heavy encouragement for more, more people to attend some of our college campuses. Okay. And the campus in AJ could use some greater population of students. All right, thank you. Board Member Kasuga. Nothing for me. All right, Board Member Smith. I've been reading a lot on um, student achievement lately. And I just wanted to acknowledge the volunteers and the students that are active in the different clubs. I think that's great that this is offered and that they're 
adding to their workload by being involved in these different activities. So I, I really think that's great for the students. Thank you. Okay, thank you. For my, my part of it, I attended the uh, All-American Academic Team uh, event that was up and on the 28th of February up in Tempe. It was really great. We had six students from different campuses. We had, uh, I think Dr. Elliott talked about Tiffany McClellan it, being a Coca-Cola uh, scholar, I think, right? Yeah, and then we had uh, uh, Sonia Elstead from Maricopa Campus, Maritza Lopez from Maricopa Campus, and then Tiffany's from Santan. Uh, Lillian Medrano is uh, Signal Peak from here. Uh, Martha Merez, Signal Peak, and then we had Teresa Smith from Santan Campus in different disciplines, psychology, nursing, some pharmacy. Uh, so those, all those are really great disciplines, so we want to congratulate them for, for their efforts and their recognition and thank all the staff that helped put that on. It was a, quite an event, and it was like 77 colleges, I believe, our students represented, but from all the colleges they could pick uh, Every college could pick two students, and so parents were all there, very proud of their, their students, and it was a great event, so I really enjoyed it. Just wanted to mention that. Great, and I think with that, I think we're done, and uh, our next meeting is going to be April 16th, 2024, here at Signal Peak, so if there's no comments, I'll declare this meeting adjourned. Great. Adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. You're good, April 16th, here. Yes. Thank you all for attending.